Uh, hello, everyone. Today we are going to talk about medieval India. Uh, so the and also we are going to talk about uh, encounters between India with Islam. Uh, so this is the chronology of medieval India. Uh, but before we talk about what happened in India, we have to pay attention to the spread of Islam. So we learned that in previous sessions that um, Muhammad established um, Islam religion in Middle East. Uh, Muhammad displayed the genius as, as both a political stra a strategist and a religious teacher. He gave the Arabs um, the idea of a unique and unified woman, which means community. The woman was to be a religious and a political community led by Muhammad for the achievement of God's will on earth. In the early seventeenth, uh, in the early seventh century. The Southern Arab tribal confederations lacked a cohesiveness and were constantly fighting with each other. The Islamic notion of an absolute higher authority trans, um, no, went beyond the boundaries of individual tribal units and fostered the political consolidation of the tribal confederations. Okay, uh, so after the Prophet's death, Islam spread far beyond Arabia. In the 6th century, two powerful empires divided the Middle East. The Christian Greek Byzantine Empire centered at Constantinople and the Zoroastrian Persian Sassanid Empire concentrated at uh, Tasfum in today's Iraq. So Zoroastrian was the original religion in Persia Empire. Okay, let's look at the map. So here is the Byzantine Empire, and here is the Persia Empire. Although each empire maintained an official state religion, uh, in Byzantine Empire it was uh, Christian, and in Persia it was uh, Zoroastrian. Neither of them possessed religious unity. Both had sizable Jewish populations, and within Byzantine uh, sects that Orthodox Greeks considered heretical were politically divis uh, divisive forces. During the 4th through 6th centuries, these two empires fought each other fiercely each trying to expand its territories at the expense of the other. They also sought to control and tax the rich trade coming from Arabia and the Indian Ocean regions. Many peripheral societies were drawn into the conflict. The resulting disorder facilitated the growth of Muslim states. The second and third successors of Muhammad, uh, Uma, where, and uh, Uthman, launched a two-pronged attack attack against the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. One force moved. One force moved north against the Byzantine provinces of Syria and Palestine. From Syria, the Muslim conquered Egypt, taking the commercial and intellectual hub of Alexandria in 642. Simultaneously, Arab armies swept into the Sassanid Empire. The Muslim defeat of the Persians at Nihawand in 642 signaled the collapse of this empire. The Muslims continued their drive eastward into Central Asia. The clash of Muslim horsemen with a Chinese army 
uh, at the Talas River, far here, in 751, marked the, first, uh, the furthest Islamic penetration into Central Asia. From southern Persia, a Muslim force marched into the Indus Valley, uh, here. In northern India and in 713, founded an Islamic community there. Beginning in the 11th century, Muslim dynasties from Ghazni in Afghanistan carried Islam deeper into the Indian subcontinent. Here. Uh, likewise, to the West, uh, Arab forces moved across North Africa and crossed the Strait of uh, Gibraltar here. In 711, at the Guadalete River, they easily defeated the Visigothic Kingdom of Spain, and the Muslim controlled most of Spain until the 13th century. Advances into France were stopped in 732 when the Franks defeated Arab armies in a battle near the city of Tours, and Muslim occupations of parts of southern France did not last long. So we can see the Arabian people established a huge uh, empire across Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, uh, India continent, uh, etc. So how can this rapid and remarkable expansion be explained? The eternal value of Muslim historians was that God supported the Islamic faith and aided its spread. The external especially European, view you used to be that religious fever was the main driving force. But today, few historians emphasize religious zeal alone, but rather point to a combination of Arab military adva advantages and the political weakness, 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 weaknesses of their opponents. Excuse me. The Byzantine and the Sassanid empires had just fought a grueling century-long war and had also been weakened by the plague. Equally important are the military strength and the tactics of the Arabs. For example, rather than scattering as landlords of peasant farmers over conquered lands, Arab soldiers remained together in garrison cities, where their Arab ethnicity, tribal organization, religion, and military success set them apart. Uh, so how did the conquered people make sense of their new subordinate situations? Jews and Christians tried to minimize the damage done to their former status and played down the gains, uh, the gains of their new masters. Uh, Christians regarded the conquering Arabs as God's punishment for their sins. Jews saw the Arabs as inst uh, instruments for their deliverance from Greek and Sassanid persecution. While the conquered peoples figured out their situation as subordinates, Muslims had to figure out how to rule their new territories after Muhammad's death. The government they established is called the Caliphate. Okay, now let's move to the Indian continent. After the decline of the Gupta Empire, India once again broke into separate kingdoms that were frequently at war with each other. Most of the dynasties of India medieval age were short-lived. Uh, but a balance of power was maintained between the major regions of India, with none gaining enough of an advantage, advantage to conquer the others. Political division fostered the development of regional cultures. 
literature came to be written in Indian's regional languages, among them Marathi, Bengali, and Assamese. Commerce continued as before, and the coast of the coasts of India remained important in the sea trade of the Indian Ocean. The first encounters which Islam occurred in this period. In 711, the Umayyad governor of Iraq sent a force with six thousand he-、uh, horses and six thousand camel to seize the sand area. In west western India, so today's Pakistan,、uh, the western part of India remained a part of the Caliphate for centuries, but but Islam did not spread much beyond this foothold. During the ninth and tenth centuries, Turks from Central Asia moved into this region of today's. Northeastern Iran and Western Afghanistan, then known as the Khurasan. Here, converts to Islam, they first served as military forces for the caliphates in Baghdad, but as its authority weakened, they made themselves rulers of an effectively independent Khurasan and frequently sent. Sent ra- ra-、uh, raiding parties into North India. Beginning in 997, Muhammad of Ghazni led 17th annual forays into India from his base in modern Afghanistan. His goal was plunder to finance his wars against other Turkish rulers in Central Asia. Eventually, even the Arab conquerors of the Sand fell to the Turks. By 1030, the Indus Valley, the Punjab, and the rest of northwest India were in the grip of the Turks. So I'll show you another map later. So I hope this larger map、uh, will show you more clearly about the spread. Of Islam in Middle West, from Middle West to the Indian continent. After an initial period of raids and destruction of temples, the Muslim Turks came to an accommodation with the Hindus, who were classed as a protected people, like the Christians and the Jews,、uh, and allowed to follow their own religion. They had to pay a special tax, but did not have to perform military service. Local chiefs and rajas were often allowed to remain in control of their domains as long as they paid tribute. Most Indians looked on the Muslim conquerors as a new ruling caste. Oh,、uh, so the new ruling caste. Were capable of governing and taxing them, but otherwise peripheral to their lives. The myriad caste largely governed themselves, isolating the newcomers. Nevertheless, over the course of several centuries, Islam gained a strong hold on North India, especially in the Indus Valley, uh, today's Pakistan, and in Bengal at the mouth. Of the Ganges River, in today's Bangladesh. Moreover, the Sultanate seems to have had a positive effect on the economy. Much of the wealth, much of the wealth,、uh, confiscated from temples, was put to more productive use, and India's first truly large cities emerged. The Turks also were eager to employ. Skilled workers giving new opportunities to low-cost manual and artisan labor. The Muslim rulers were much more hostile to Buddhism than to Hinduism. They saw Buddhism as a competitive religion. In eleven nineteen three, a Turkish 
Reading Party destroyed the Great Buddhist University at Nalanda in Bihar. So these are the ruins of this great university. Uh, Buddhist monks were killed or forced to flee to Buddhist centers in Southeast Asia, Nepal, and Tibet. Buddhism, which had thrived for so long in peaceful and friendly competition with Hinduism, went into decline in its native land. Hinduism, however, remained as strong as ever. South India was largely unaffected by these invasions, and the traditional Hindu culture flourished there, and the native kings ruling small kingdoms. Temple-centered Hinduism flourished, as did devotional cults and mystical movements. This was a great age of religious art and architecture in India. Extraordinary temples covered with elaborate base relief were built in many areas. And then it's the Delhi Sultanate. Uh, in the 12th century, a new line of Turkish rulers arose in Afghanistan, led by Muhammad of Gur. Uh, so he died probably in 1206. Uh, Muhammad captured Delhi and extended his control nearly throughout North India. So here is the map. When he fell to an assassin in 1206, one of his generals, the former slave, Qutbad Din, took over and established a government at Delhi, separate from the government in Afghanistan. This Sultanate of Delhi lasted for three centuries, even though dynasties changed several times. A major accomplishment of the Delhi Sultanate was holding off the Mongols, Chinggis Han, in the 13th century. Although the Turks by this time were highly cosmopolitan and no longer nomadic, they had retained their martial skills and understanding of steppe warfare. Chinggis Han and his troops entered the Indus Valley in 1221 in pursuit of the Shah of Khurasan in today's Afghanistan. The Sultan wisely kept out of the way, and when Chinggis Han left some troops in the area, the Sultan made no attempt to challenge them. Two generations later, in 1299, a Mongol Han launched a campaign into India with 200 southern men. But the Sultan of the time was able to defeat them. Two years later, the Mongols returned and camped at Delhi for two months, but they eventually left without taking the Sultan's fort. Another Mongol raid in 1306 to 1307, also was successfully repulsed. During the 14th century, however, the Delhi Sultanate was in decline and proved unable to ward off the armies of Timur. So Timur, he took Delhi in 1398. Um, his chronicler reported that when the troops drew up for battle outside Delhi, the Sultanate had 10,000 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers, and 120 war elephants. Though alarmed at the sight of the elephant, Timur's men dug trenches to trap them and shot at their drivers. The Sultan fled, leaving the city to surrender. Timur took as, as booty all the elephants, loading them with treasures seized from the city. Timur's invasion left a weakened Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate endured under different rulers until 1526, when it was conquered by the Mughals, a Muslim dynasty that would rule over most of northern India from the 16th century into the 19th century, 
until the British colonists entered the、uh, Indian continent. Now let's look at life in medieval India. Local institutions played a much larger role in the lives of the overwhelming majority of people in medieval India than did the state. Craft guilds oversaw conditions of work and trade. Local councils handled law and order at the town of village level, and local castes gave members a sense of belonging and identity. Like peasant societies elsewhere, including in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia, agricultural life in India ordinarily meant village life. The average farmer worked a small plot of land outside the village. All the family members pooled their resources, and the dis、uh, under the direction of the head of the family. This joint effort strengthened family solidar solidarity. The agricultural year began with spring plowing, the traditional plow, drawn by two oxen wearing yokes and collars, like in this photo.、Uh, they had an iron tip to share and a handle. Uh, with which the farmers guided it. Uh, rice, the most important and popular grain, was sown at the beginning of the long rainy season.、Uh, they also planted beans, lentils, and peas during the cold season, and were harvested in the spring. Cereal crops such as wheat, barley, and millet provided carbohydrates and other nutri、uh, nutrients. Sugar cane was another important crop. Some families cultivated vegetables, spices, fruit trees, and flowers in their gardens.、Uh, farmers also raised the livestock. Most highly valued were cattle, which were raised for plowing and milk, hides and horns. But Hindus did not slaughter them for meat, like the Islamic and Jewish prohibition on the consumption of pork. The eating of beef was forbidden among Hindus. Local craftsmen and tradesmen. Lived and worked in specific parts of a town or village. They were frequently organized into guilds, with guilds heads and guild rulers.、Uh, the textile industries were particularly well developed. Silk,、uh, which had entered India from China, linen, wool, and cotton fabrics. Were produced in large quantities and traded throughout India and beyond. Uh, I have talked a lot about the caste system, so the caste system, uh, reached its mature form during this period. Now let's look at families. Uh, for all members of Indian society, regardless of caste, marriage and family were the focus of life. As in China, the family was under the authority of the eldest male, who might take several wives, and ideally sons stayed home with their parents after they married. The family affirmed its solidarity.、Uh, Solidarity by the religious rituals of honoring its dead ancestors, a ritual that linked the living and the dead, much like ancestor worship in China. People commonly lived in extended families: grandparents, uncles and aunts, cousins and nieces and nephews, all lived together in the same house or compound. 
、uh, children in poor households worked as soon as they were able. Children in wealthier households faced the age-old irritation of learning reading, writing, and、uh, arithmetic. Less attention was paid to daughters than to sons, though in more prosperous families they were often literate. Because girls who had lost their virginity could seldom hope to find a good husband,、uh, and thus would become financial burdens and social disgraces to their families. A wife was expected to have no life apart from her husband. A widow was expected to lead the hard life of the ascetic. Sleeping on the ground, eating only one simple meal a day without meat, wine, salt, or honey, wearing plain and dyed clothes without jewelry, and shaving her head. She was viewed as inauspicious to everyone but her children, and she did not attend family festivals. Among high caste Hindus, a widow would be praised for throwing herself. On her husband's funeral pyre, Buddhist sects objected to this pra- practice called sati, but some Hindu religious authorities declared that by self-immolation, a widow could expunge both her own and her husband's sins, so that both would enjoy eternal bliss in heaven. And this practice was abandoned,、uh, abolished by the British colonists by law.、Uh, we talked a lot about the erotic literature and art in Asian societies. So, in India, the most famous book was the Kama Sutra, Book on the Art of Love. This book was,、uh, this is the cover of the first version. Uh, of English translation of those this book in, I think in nineteenth century, but it was forbidden to publish because of its erotic、uh, elements until nineteen sixties. Ah,、uh, so thank you very much for listening to today's lecture. I also have a pop quiz for you for extra bonus point. Uh, so the question is: Did Muslim hate or、uh, get along well with Buddhism in India? So please send the answer by email to me, and you will get the extra bonus point.